Right, so last time we started to look at open and closed balls. And uh, we were looking at bounded sets. And uh, let me see, what do we have? We were looking at uh, what does it mean for a set to be bounded. And then we had that open or closed balls said to the origin were bounded. And then uh, I made, I had a slight misprint in the lecture, in case anybody didn't notice. For some reason or other, I kept losing the bars for the top of some of my closed balls, which turns them into open balls if you forget the bars on top. Uh, it doesn't affect the proof very much, but there are a couple of places where I still managed to leave a bar off last time. So if you've got your notes from last time, I was trying to show that the closed ball with radius little r was bounded but I kept missing the bar off the top, which meant that my proof was showing that the, op the proof about the bars on the top shows that the open ball with radius little r is bounded. Fortunately, the same proof happens to work for the closed ball as well, but uh, I guess that means you've got two proofs for the price of one. But if you want actually the proof of what I was trying to prove last time, you should put the bars back in where they were missing. And that's been corrected in the version of the annotated slides that you'll find on the module web page. Then we said the empty set is bounded, but if you take the whole of R to the D, it isn't. Uh, so the whole of R to the D is an unbounded set because, of course, it goes off, in fact, every direction to infinity. Um, and you can't enclose it in any particular finite radius ball. I didn't prove that for you properly. Uh, and I left it to you to check the details, but if you're having any difficulties with that, let me know. I can always supply further details. And then I gave you a sketch of why every subset of a bounded set is still bounded, and again, left it to you to fill in the missing details. We have some comments about one-dimensional bounded sets and the connection with bounded above and bounded below from last year. Sets of finite diameter, and then we started to move on to intervals. I reminded you about closed intervals, open intervals, half open intervals, and sets that aren't intervals. And if you write down a, a general set, most sets are not intervals. Intervals are very special sets. So you shouldn't always assume that the set you're working with is an interval, or else you're only going to be proving a special case. And then we wanted to move into higher dimensions. So I told you that we're going to do Cartesian products. And Cartesian products, if you remember, have nothing to do with multiplication of real numbers. It's simply about saying that you're going to restrict each coordinate separately. And you're going to say, in which set is the first coordinate going to be, in which set is the second coordinate going to be, and so on, up to the dth coordinate. And so you have the Cartesian product notation, a product of intervals. That means you state separately which interval each of your coordinates is going to be stuck in. So the first coordinate gets stuck in the first interval, and so on, up to the dth coordinate is going to be stuck in the dth interval. And that will give you a Cartesian product of intervals. So that gave us what we call D cells, which some authors call intervals. You can figure them as hypercuboids. And we had an open D cell, and we had closed D cells, and then lots of different possible combinations. So let's see what sort of sets we have. Let's look in two dimensions where it's easiest to draw the pictures. If you go to three dimensions, you're going to want uh, three dimensional cuboids, and if you go into four dimensions or higher, it's going to be particularly hard to draw the pictures. So two dimensions is the easiest one to draw examples. And so when you take a product of two intervals, as we saw earlier, you get some sort of rectangle. But depending on which kind of intervals you product with each other will tell you which edges, if any, are missing and which edges, if any, are included. So some of the edges may be included, some of them may be excluded. You'll have to work out for yourself what happens at the corners. So the closed cell, 1, 2, cross 1, 2, that's 
not just a rectangle, it's a special kind of rectangle, maybe a square. And I again apologise for any distortion in the scale due to the fact that I'm working on a widescreen screen. So if you're doing 1, 2 cross 1, 2 inclusive, so this is uh, a closed square, boundary included. <coughs> Where if you do the... Uh, open two cell, you're going to do boundary excluded. So we've just done that one. Now we'll look at the product of two open intervals, which is pretty much the same picture. Only this time I need a dotted boundary, dotted or dashed. <coughs> so this time it's a product of two open intervals. and the boundary is excluded. I recommend when you do any sort of sketches, first of all, you try and use these dotted or dashed boundaries to show whether something's included or excluded, but just to play it safe, that you also uh, include some, some writing as well, so that there's no possibility of anybody misunderstanding what's going on. So you should have a clear diagram and some written explanation of what's going on, and that way no one's going to take any marks away. But what happens when you mix it? Let me do something that's a rectangle. Well, OK, we're still doing 1, 2 cross 1, 2, but we'll do a different one. Well, let's do... Uh, Let's stick to squares since all the others are squares. I suggest with an exercise you do some rectangles. But if you do this one, that's x, y, and r squared, for which 1 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 2, and 1 is less than y is less than 2. So that you're going to include the points where x is exactly 1 or 2, but exclude the points where y is exactly 1 or 2. So this particular one, So when x is 1 or 2, you're going to get the whole edge in, with the possible exception of the corners. <laughs> but when y is 1 or 2, that edge is excluded. And you can work out for yourself whether the corners are in or out. <coughs> so this is uh, closed interval crossed with the open interval, um, so that's uh, a square including the vertical edges excluding the horizontal edges of an exercise 
Think about the quarters. And I said, there are 14 others. Well, how can you work out how many there are? Well, it's a product of two intervals. And as we know, there are four kinds of bounded interval. So there are four types of interval that you could have for the x-coordinate to be stuck in, and four kinds of interval that the y-coordinate can be stuck in. So that gives you a total of four times four, 16 possible kinds of square or rectangle you could be looking at. Now, two of those are we listed already. It's the, the closed one, which includes all the edges, and the open one, which excludes all the edges. And so the other ones, which include or exclude some of the edges, uh, but are neither the closed nor the open, there's 14 left out of the 16. Anybody got any questions for me on uh, these various different kinds of square or rectangle? Well, if you do come up with any questions, remember uh, you're welcome to email me or drop in in office hours or you can ask me after the lecture. Um, I'm always happy to answer questions. Now, so the 16 kinds in two dimensions of these bounded interval or bounded D cell go to three dimensions, then you've got 4 times 4 times 4, so that's 4 cubed or 2 to the 6. And if you move up to D dimensions, then um, it's 4 to the D or 2 to the 2D. We didn't prove they were bounded. Uh, again, you can, you can check that for yourself, or you can do it from stuff on the question sheets, or if it's not obvious to you that they're bounded, then I can always give you some more details. Have a look at what you get from the question sheets, because you'll have enough, by the time you look at the question sheets, you'll have more information. Uh, you are supposed to know the fact that these so-called bounded D cells are bounded, and you could assume that and quote, this is a standard bounded D cell, unless you're in a question which says, prove that this D cell is bounded. This is a, uh, another standard thing in this module is that you can usually assume standard results unless you're being asked to prove that result, or you're being asked to prove an earlier result for the module which was used to prove the result you're quoting. So you're not allowed circularity. Uh, you're, not allowed to, you're not allowed to quote a result in order to prove itself. And if it was an earlier result for the module that was used to prove something, you shouldn't use the later thing to prove the earlier thing, because that would be circular. I do remember that the, there was an exam I set a few years ago where I asked people to prove certain things about the algebra of limits, and everybody... No, not everybody, but a large number of people, when asked to prove things about the algebra of limits, said, by the algebra of limits, this holds. So they proved the algebra of limits using the algebra of limits, um, which, unfortunately, wasn't worth very many marks. So if, you mustn't use the result to prove itself, because that's not worth anything. <laughs> So we finish off this chapter with a uh, discussion of unbounded D cells. You already know about uh, all the different kinds of intervals in the real line. So, so of course, in R, the whole real line is equal to the open interval from minus infinity up to infinity. Remember that... Uh, which you can also write as minus infinity up to plus infinity. You have to exclude plus or minus infinity because they're not real numbers. So obviously they're not going to be included in any interval of real numbers. And we're only working with intervals of real numbers in this module. Um, in our new notation that goes from minus infinity up to plus infinity and so on all the different possible ways of writing that there are. 
R plus You can write that as naught infinity or naught infinity either way with, with either kind of excluding infinity, but for us, R plus includes zero, remember? So that's the non-negative real numbers. Now, suppose you wanted to have a half plane <coughs> let's suppose you wanted to get the right hand half plane including the y axis <coughs> so how do you get the right hand half plane i guess it's rather impossible to uh, shade forever. Maybe I'll have some dots. Uh, that might make it clearer. So this is the right hand. Half plane. This is some sort of unbounded D cell. Uh, if, you inc if you include the y-axis, then let's work out what that's got to be. This is the set. X is allowed to be between uh, greater or equal to zero, including zero, but of course X is not allowed to be infinity, and y is allowed to be anything except it's excluding plus or minus infinity. So we'll go. Um, that's the same as r plus cross r. x is allowed to be an r plus, y is allowed to be an r. And that's how you write it as a Cartesian product, and that's a typical unbounded two cell. And again, one way to see it's unbounded is because you can go off to infinity either along the positive real axis or indeed in this case you can go up, the y, up or down the y-axis. If you'd excluded the y-axis you wouldn't have been allowed to use the y-axis to show it was uh, unbounded. But the x-axis is safe enough. Yeah.